So um, anyway, welcome all to it. Nice to come out. Uh, this, this has been a, a busy week for the society. On Tuesday, uh, the, um, we were at Government House where Lieutenant Governor Crosby presented a Heritage Award to uh, Dr. Jim Hiller, a recently retired professor from the History Department at Memorial. And Mr. Crosby does us the great honor of uh, serving as patron of the society. And uh, for Dr. Hill, Hiller, that's well-earned recognition. Uh, for anyone not familiar with the Heritage Award, it, it recognizes uh, outstanding contributions to the uh, history and heritage of Newfoundland and Labrador. And Dr. Hiller has been uh, a practitioner of, well, one of the most leading researchers of historical material for the last 40 years here at Memorial. And uh, so it's an honor well deserved. Uh, one other business item, uh, we're on again, off again, as far as our office is concerned. I keep saying this every month, but uh, uh, we were advised on Tuesday that we have to vacate our office at Elizabeth Towers when our lease is up the end of March. Uh, we don't know where we're going yet, but we'll find a place and we'll keep everybody posted. Uh, one last item before I introduce tonight's speaker. Uh, you may have noticed, uh, but the uh, Premier made reference to heritage issues in the uh, conservative blue book uh, during the last election campaign. And uh, there was a strong focus on uh, great war uh, commemorations between 2014 and 2018. And uh, society's been asked to uh, sit on some steering committees and to kickstart the, uh, the uh, series of events with a two to three day symposium. And uh, we've already uh, had meetings with the Royal Newfoundland Regiment, with provincial <coughs> officials, and we're developing a funding proposal now, so we'll keep you posted on that as well. Now, that's a few years away, of course. Our next major symposium is uh, in September of 2012, next year, and that's on uh, Captain James Cook and his uh, ramblings and roamings around Newfoundland in the late 1700s. And uh, we've got some great speakers lined up on that, so keep your uh, keep alert to that one. In fact, uh, Fred Smith, our Vice President, is leading the charge in that. He was telling me that today is actually James Cook's birthday. Uh, so, rather appropriate. So, Fred, what would that make him? Probably born around the mid-79s, but 250 years old today, so we don't have enough candles for the kick, you know, so. Anyway, that, that will be a, a good one. Um, okay, uh, I'm delighted to introduce tonight's uh, presentation. Uh, this society is all about history and heritage, and uh, our speaker tonight is all about the conservation of our natural heritage. Uh, before he retired, uh, Don Hustins uh, served as director of parks and natural areas uh, with the province, and it's a good fit for someone with uh, Don's background and uh, interests. Uh, Don trained as a forester, uh, obtaining a bachelor's and master's degree from the University of New Brunswick. Uh, his work with the province included chairing the Canadian Heritage Rivers Program, and he was heavily involved in getting the, uh, the Bay de Nord and the main rivers uh, designated as Canadian Heritage Rivers uh, in Newfoundland. And uh, with the Parks Division, he was also involved in the establishment of the uh, Torngat Mountain National Park in Northern Labrador. Now, those are important contributions, but uh, it's Don's work as a volunteer with uh, salmon and trout conservation uh, groups that really stands out, uh, activities that he's been involved with for uh, over 40 years. Uh, he was a founding member of SAME, which is the uh, Salmon Association of Eastern Newfoundland, and since that group was formed in 1979, Don has served in almost every executive capacity they have, president, vice president, treasurer, secretary, and he chaired a number of SANE committees as well. And the one that stands out in my mind, uh, because I was involved myself, uh, is the St. Mary's Bay Atlantic Salmon Enhancement Program. Uh, and that group, uh, he chaired that group for over a decade. And it, it was the first community-sponsored salmon enhancement program anywhere in Atlantic Canada. And it led to uh, very major salmon enhancement successes on the uh, Colonnette and the Rocky Rivers, which are two of the largest watersheds uh, on the Anvil. And then in 2005, he went on to be president of the Salmonid Council of Newfoundland and Labrador, and that led to broader involvements with the Atlantic Salmon Federation and with uh, regional councils uh, throughout 
Atlantic Canada and uh, in, in, in New England. And for all of those contributions, uh, he's been presented with a number of uh, conservation and environment awards. And through all those years, Don wrote regular articles for a number of periodicals. The ones that stand out for me are the Atlantic Salmon Journal, uh, Spawner Magazine, and Sportsman Magazine. Uh, regular articles there as well. And then when he retired in 1999, he started researching the history of salmon conservation in Newfoundland. And that led to two books. And the last one, uh, last year, uh, was titled River of Dreams, The History of Salmon Conservation in Newfoundland. And it's an excellent piece of work. I recommend it highly. And it's the topic of tonight's lecture. Uh, on the personal side, Don has been angling since he was nine years old when his father uh, first took him out on an outing. And he's a staunch believer in catch and release fishing. Uh, he prefers to angle alone. And uh, no one has ever actually seen him catch a salmon. So his contribution to salmon conservation may be even greater than we, than we think. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Don Hustins. Thank you, Larry. Thank you very much for your comments. Now I get this uh, tech wheel system working here. I guess I've had a lot of competition to be here tonight. I see in the news that uh, Mike Holmes, the guy who has the uh, home show and home repair, is speaking at the rooms. And there's another uh, speaker here tonight talking about salmon in the city. It's the, at the Lantern. They're talking about the genetically modified salmon. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I'm glad you say saw fit to come here and listen about the wild salmon and my talk here tonight. It's a pleasure to be able to talk to you here tonight about the, uh, the history and the conservation of salmon in this province because it does have a, a wonderful background history and interest. And uh, what I'll be doing is giving you the history as I presented in my book uh, that Larry mentioned that I produced and published last year. So the book, uh, oops, I gave you two good things here. The book is entitled Rivers of Dreams. Uh, and what is it all about? Well, it's all about the uh, early conservation efforts of uh, government and individuals in conserving our salmon stocks from 1700 to 1949. Uh, it looks at the experiences of the early anglers, the rivers they fished, why they came to Newfoundland, the experiences they had, and what they did here. Uh, it talks about the, the big fish they caught, like the 68 pound around the Torrent River, and the 41 pound around the Little Cod Ryan, and so forth. And then it gets into uh, how salmon angling really developed the tourism in this province, tourism as we know it today. Because in the early years, the first tourists were the anglers, the salmon anglers on the west coast and throughout the province. Then last but not least, I have a final chapter that leaps forward from 1949 right up to current, and I discuss the status of the salmon stocks uh, as they are today. So, before we get into the, uh, the current, the angling activity, I think it's important that we have a look at how the commercial fishery, the early commercial fishery in the province was undertaken and what effect that would have had on, on, on the salmon stocks. And in 1705, the first commercial fishery license was issued to a guy named George Skippington. And he had a license for the gander in the freshwater bay areas. He was the first one, but there were many other people, of course, doing the same thing. And even all the Libyans along the coast, the settlers, they were legally allowed to fish salmon in the rivers. Uh, they were legally allowed to net the rivers at the time. And of course, you can well imagine there's no thought for conservation. Everyone thought the salmon stocks were inexhaustible, and there were no laws uh, preventing anyone from fishing in any way, shape, or form. And then about 1816, in Labrador, the first regulation appeared to control the salmon harvest. And what happened in 1816, Labradorians petitioned the government so that the Americans and the Nova Scotians who were fishing the salmon in their nets in the ocean couldn't fish him so close to shore. And the Governor, Ham Governor Hamilton brought in this regulation that said you can't use nets any more than 40 yards uh, closer to each other. So it wasn't really a protection, a conservation measure. It was really to control the fisheries and the number of fishermen out there. But Hamilton also made a recommendation at the time that there should be a weekly closure of the commercial fishery so that all salmon or a number of salmon could reach the spawning grounds. And unfortunately, of course, the government didn't accept that at the time, and it didn't get passed. 
But that was the first, and all the evidence I've gathered over the years, the first thing I saw was that as a suggestion that the spawning grounds needed to be needed to have salmon and to perpetuate the species. A few years later, in 1862, uh, the government came up with a suggestion of uh, controlling the harvest by and allowing more salmon to get on the spawning beds by bringing in legislation that prohibited nets from going any further than one third across the river, thereby assuming that the other two thirds of the river was the waterway enough that the salmon could get up the river and reach the spawning grounds. But like anything else, uh, those regulations didn't really help with the salmon stocks at the time because there was no enforcement. There was no one there to keep an eye on. But that changed. Uh, in 1871, the first wardens were appointed. And they were involved, of course, very directly in terms of enforcing the regulations. The wardens that were appointed were, there was eight of them initially. They were in Pizentia Bay, on the south coast, St. Mary's Bay, Notre Dame Bay, Bonavista Bay. There was only eight initially. And one of the most famous ones there was Thomas Payton from the exploits. He was also a commercial fisherman, so he also had his nets out in the river legally as well. The, the duties that the wardens performed were rather interesting at the time. They were there to tell the settlers <coughs> of the law, the, restricting only one third, in other words, the net across the river. And they informed them of the laws because they didn't have any papers and notices in those days of what was going on, and told them about the importance of allowing the salmon to get the spawning beds. And they also recorded the angler catches, the early angler catches on the rivers, giving us the first and earliest indication of some, some of the abundance of salmon on our various rivers. But like anything else, I guess, that uh, started off in the early stages, there was a lot of problems associated with the warden service. And in particular, the, the greatest problem, I guess, they hired local men, which you normally would do. The preference would have been to hire people from outside area where they could prosecute their neighbors and their friends and their uncles and so forth. But it wasn't done. They hired the local people. Uh, many were politically appointed, and, and most were unqualified. They had 60, 70-year-old and 80-year-old people who had to patrol those rivers, and they just couldn't possibly do it. They were paid very little. Uh, the average salary was $40 a season, which was a fair amount of money. But on the other hand, that was during the season when the cod fishery was very active. So they didn't pay much attention to the salmon. Their preference and their activity had to be uh, isolated uh, with the, uh, the cod fishery. Now you can only imagine what resistance they must have received from their local friends and neighbors. I mean, you consider it was really a birthright for those people to be netting river because their parents and their grandparents had done it before them. So they did receive an awful lot of resistance and certainly a barrel or two of salmon for any of those people living off the coastline 200 years ago was a tremendous amount uh, of food for the, for the winter supply. And last but not least, uh, the location of the rivers. Uh, they had many rivers. There was no ATVs, of course. There were no trails. They had access to those rivers on foot and by boat. And as a result, of course, many of the rivers that they were responsible for didn't get, uh, didn't get visited at all. And as a result, uh, unfortunately, the warden service was uh, abandoned reappointed, abandoned, and reappointed a number of times over the uh, subsequent years. But nevertheless, it was the beginning. Okay, so this intensive netting uh, was soon having a very delirious effect on salmon stock, and everyone recognized it by the mid-1800s. And what I'm going to show you right here are some figures about, uh, about the catches. On the Gander River, for example, the commercial catches had gone from 1,000 tierces to 30 tierces. A tierce was a wooden barrel capable of holding around 350 pounds of salmon. Uh, on the Exploits River, it went from 300 to 10 to 20 tierces. Uh, in Bisky Bay, a small Bisky Bay had a commercial fishery. It went from 100 tierces to 10. And even Conlet River, even smaller than Bisky Bay, went from 27 tierces down to 5. And there was a lot of concern with the commercial catches at the time. There was no discussion about the sport fishery because it didn't exist. Uh, and as a result, there were five inquiries held between 1885 and 1889, each year, basically, to address the concerns with the salmon stocks. And each inquiry uh, acknowledged, yes, the stocks are down, and there's something there seriously need to be done. Uh, they produced numerous recommendations, but they're all ignored. 
Uh, finally, in, in uh, 1888, uh, government uh, did appoint a fishery commissioner, a well-known judge, uh, Judge Crouch, uh, Judge Daniel Crouch, and he was appointed to look at the whole situation. Uh, the same year, they enacted the first uh, closed season, uh, allowing the fish lovers to have access to the spawning grounds without being taken by spears and torches and whatever else there might be. And that was the uh, closed season from September the 15th to December the 15th in 1888. In the same year, again, they finally saw fit to reappoint the, the, the warden service. So in addition to having, <coughs> excuse me, the wardens, they thought of any number of other things to increase salmon stocks in this province. And one of the most interesting things they gave some very serious thought to was leasing rivers. And this was done in the early, uh, looking at this in the 1880s. We had several prominent Newfoundlanders, Judge Krause himself, uh, Moses Harvey, and Alexander Murray with the Geological Survey, very prominent people in society who recommended the government you should lease the salmon rivers. And they were so concerned about the declining salmon stocks that was only terminated or exterminated that they suggested, yes, government, the best way to save these stocks are to lease the rivers. We had in the early 1900s the non-resident anglers coming to Newfoundland from, uh, from the States and Canada. Uh, they also saw the value of leasing salmon rivers. They suggested that rivers should be leased. One particular example was a club from New York who wanted to lease the Upper Humber from Deer Lake all the way up for hunting and fishing, and they were willing to pay several thousand dollars for it. This was in the early 1900s. We had other people wanting to rent Castor's River, River Ponds, for two or three thousand dollars at the time. So government really had a difficult position. Uh, because of all the problems with the warden service, they couldn't finance it. And as I mentioned, it was abandoned and re restated a number of times. Uh, but the leasing, gave them an opportunity, or would have given them an opportunity, to provide uh, money to protect the resource. But on the other hand, leasing would also lock up the rivers. It would lock it up to those wealthy few people who would have access and deter use from tourists. Another thing they thought about was introducing Westerbush salmon eggs into Newfoundland rivers. Now those of you who are familiar with the Westerbush River in New Brunswick is well known for multi-sea winter salmon, the large fish, 20, 30 pounds or more. Uh, they actually ordered eggs from the rest of Bush that was all approved by Canada, the government of Canada, and they were ready to send here to Newfoundland, and I couldn't find any documentation that they actually got here. But they came that close to bringing in uh, the rest of Bush salmon eggs with the view of bringing in large salmon, because the large salmon were all eliminated by the commercial fishery. And then there was some serious thought of building hatcheries. We needed a hatchery, and this is all the 1880s, 1890s, early 1900s. We need salmon hatcheries. Well, there were two schools of thought on the hatcheries. We had a Dr. Lawrence Keegan, uh, who was in St. John's. He worked at the hospital. And he was also the president of the Newfoundland Game Fish Protection Society, which is commonly Murray's, com commonly called Murray's Pond today. They had experience of introducing the brown trout and rainbow trout successfully throughout the problems. And of course, they advocated hatcheries, because that's what they used. And contravening that argument was Judge Daniel Prouse, our commissioner, who had the upper say, obviously being hired as a commissioner. And he advocated, well, uh, no, let's use natural production. We don't need hatcheries. Natural production with good enforcement, with those wardens that I mentioned earlier. And coupled with that, uh, we could have the salmon in our rivers again. They actually had the information given to them in 1888, uh, whereby for $1,200, they could have built a hatchery and produced two million salmon eggs. They had that information in their hands, and at the time they said, no, we'll just continue with Krauss's philosophy and we'll use natural production. And the other thing that came up was salmon ladders. Why not open up rivers that have those impassable barriers uh, where salmon can't get up because they're too steep and too high? Let's open them up with a ladder and allow access to new spawning grounds. And that philosophy was uh, generated by Krauss himself. And as we do know, of course, the first ladder was constructed in 1904, and the Terranova, and subsequently in other years, they went on to the exploits in the Terranova as well. And just a note of interest today, I mean, where we are even today with salmon, <coughs> the exploits is booming with salmon. 
salmon lab. Carried all the booming with salmon the past few years, salmon lab. And of course, the same thing with the, uh, with the Torrent River as well. Gonna bear with me, folks, because I got two systems working here <laughs> to uh, to do this properly. Uh, okay, let's look at the uh, the first anglers. Uh, the first anglers that were really in here in the problems, using the artificial fly and the fly rod in all the books and the articles that I read through Newfoundland history, uh, they were really the explorers. And the, and the uh, military people who came here, particularly the explorers that came to document the history and our geography and our natural fauna. And in that particular case, George Cartwright, uh, he was the first one to use, uh, that, by following the documented evidence, using an artificial fly and a fly rod. And he was fishing for trout in the St. Charles River in 1770. And he was also doing the same thing in 1771 for salmon in the St. Louis Bay. And following him, of course, we also had uh, uh, the uh, British naturalist Joseph Banks, who came to Newfoundland to study the fauna, he was fishing uh, trout in 1776 on the northern peninsula with the artificial fly. Now that might sound rather strange that those dates, but it's an interesting situation. Uh, an individual who ran a historian bookshop in the States bought my book over a year ago, and he emailed me since the book was out and said, if they were the first to do that here in Labrador, they were certainly the first to do it in North America because he said this wasn't happening in the United States even at that time. But I found that rather interesting to see that this fly fishing really began here in this province. The other interesting thing with Cartwright is that he was also uh, tying his own flies in 1770 when he was in, uh, in Labrador. He described that in his, in his journals. So following those explorers, we had another bunch of people called the Naval Military Officers. And they were here initially to protect the fishery, and in particular the French shore fishery, all around Bonne Vista, Cape Ridge, and all around the west coast, and so forth. And we had individuals like Lieutenant Edward Chappell, who was here in 1818, and he was fly fishing in the rivers of Bay St. George for trout and salmon, and also the Fort Hall River in Labrador. Then we had another colorful character named Captain Richard Dashwood. Have you heard of a place called Dashwoods in central Newfoundland? That's named after him. You know, he came here in 1868. Uh, everywhere he fished, he complained about it. And he wrote a lot about it, his fishing. He complained about the fishing, he complained about the hunting, and he complained about the people in Newfoundland. And he always would say in his writings, I'm never going to go back there again, it's not worth doing the fishing. And yet the following year, you'd see him on another river, so it would away, fishing away. He, uh, he was uh, tremendously disliked by the residents of St. John's because of the negative publicity he gave to Newfoundland, uh, but he continued to come nevertheless. Uh, he was fishing in the Humber one year for about two weeks in 1903, and he landed 300 salmon in a matter of a couple of weeks, all of which he smoked and sent home to his friends in Nova Scotia. Now he, was, he did do a couple of good things. He was the first one to speak, about, speak out about the contracts and the harm the contracts were doing to the salmon. And this goes back again to the late 1880s. He was also interested in the sidelight, by the way. He was the first one to say moose should be introduced in the new plan. And uh, I think he was probably the one that he suggested the four years before it was actually done in 1875. Then we had another colorful character. His name was Captain William Kennedy. Uh, and he came, and he was there around 1880 and a number of years afterwards. <laughs> And he fished there pretty well every river for trout and salmon, every river in this province that he got his hands on, he was on. And most importantly, what he did, he wrote about those trips in a book called The Sporting Notes of Newfoundland in 1881. And in that book, he talked about the hunting and the fishing. In particular, he described the, the salmon fishing and its wonderful resource in this province. And he was the first to really document it. So now people start to know that Newfoundland not only existed with the fog and the codfish, but we had salmon rivers. It's interesting because during that period, uh, salmon angling wasn't a major activity in North America, and it only became an activity of any significance around 1860. And of course, at that time, and prior to 1980, or 1880, sorry, there were very few people fishing here, uh, residents included, 
Uh, there were a few non-residents were coming. Those people had their private yachts and had the money to travel for a while, but there was no numbers of people. Uh, access to new land was difficult. People didn't know where the rivers were. They didn't know how to get here. And of course, for them to come was very costly. So needless to say, there were very few people who were fishing here in the rivers. And our old settlers, they weren't interested in fishing in the 1880s. They all they had to do was go to the river with a net and they'd catch all the fish they wanted to eat. But that was a local change very quickly. So that changed. Most importantly, uh, in, in the 1880s, uh, when we had our first passenger service from St. John's to Topsail in 1882. And of course, that unleashed a horde of local anglers going to those ponds that would have been really inaccessible prior to that. Uh, and then a few years later, in 1898, we had the ferry connection to Nova Scotia, and we had the train going from St. John's to Fort of Bass. Now we had that connection, and it opened up Canada and the United States to, to this province. And of course, then following that, uh, a few years later, we all heard that infamous uh, Traverse train that was initiated specifically for the uh, trout fishermen in 1908. So realistically, with the railway open, ferry connection to uh, Nova Scotia, that was the beginning of tourism. The real tourism as we know it today in this province. And at the same time when that happened, of course, there was a number of people said, hold on, now we can take advantage of this. We can cater to these tourists to make some money. And the first to do it were the, uh, the Tompkins, John and Judith. And they lived on the Little Codroy River on the west coast. They came to the Newfoundland in 1883. They lived formerly in the Marguerite in Nova Scotia. And on the Marguerite River, of course, in Nova Scotia, they were used to the salmon and the anchors and so forth, saw the opportunity and built a farmhouse on the Little Codroy River. And a few years later, they, uh, they started to cater to the visiting anchors. And they were the very first, the very first people in this province that opened their doors and said, Let's have these tourists come in, these tourist anglers, and we'll cater for them. A few years later, their place was uh, run by their son, James Tompkins. And over the years, they entertained the wealthy doctors and lawyers from Philadelphia, from Boston, New York, and St. John's. Uh, many of them who were coming in the early years were staying for one, two, or three months. Considering the cost to get here and the money they had, they decided to stay in the mini giant. <coughs> and they hired up to 20 guides at peak time. Some of the famous guides were Walter Doucette and Jim McIsaac. Uh, they were also taught how to tie their own salmon flies by the Canadian and American anglers who were there. And in all likelihood, that being the case, they might have been the first people in the province who were residents that learned how to tie their own salmon flies. A few years later, uh, another place opened called the Log Cabin. And the Log Cabin was on Harry's River, at the outlet of Spruce Brook. A very famous place. Uh, that was operated by a person named, uh, what's his name here, uh, Dodd and Paul. Uh, they opened up. And that was a lodge. The Afton Farmhouse was really a rooms, like a B&B &B breakfast. This was the very first lodge exclusively developed to cater to the tourists, in particular the fishermen and, and also the hunters. And after these guys got out, of course, other enterprising new planners uh, saw the opportunity, and people like, uh, in the Dial Brothers opened places in Grand Cabaret. And the Fulfords and Piffords opened uh, places in, in Pacentia, and Kearns and Gamble, and so forth. So the important thing I'd like to mention here is this was really the beginning of the tourism. Uh, these bread and breakfasts and the lodges, they were, what they did really is transform those small, isolated communities into little tourist centers, where people were now hired as guides. They were hired as cooks. They were hired as packers for the hunters. And the tourists now had, they didn't have to walk it anymore. They had comfortable accommodations. And the comfortable accommodations, of course, helped them bring along their wives and their family. So the railway and the ferry connection really facilitated the, uh, the tourism in this province uh, uh, like we've never known before. Now, looking at some of the uh, early conservation measures, with all of these tourists coming to the province, it didn't take very long for the government of the day to say, well, hold on now, these rivers are more important to the anglers than they are to the commercial fisheries. And in 1902, 
uh, government banned the use of nets in the rivers in Thailand. Outright, no more nets to be allowed to use in the rivers. And it was in 1902, all the government reports that I read prior to that for 20 or 30 years, there was no mention of the sport fishery whatsoever. And when they start talking about 1902, of course, you can imagine the next 15 or 20 years, there was very little commercial fishery and an awful lot of the sport fishery. The following year, 1903, they also uh, uh, brought in uh, regulation that only, you can only fish with a rod and line in those salmon rivers. Uh, but while you're still allowed to use a rod and line, there was no, no regulation preventing the use of worms. And as a result, of course, the jigging became rampant. And then in 1906, they brought in regulations saying that you couldn't spear or jig any salmon in a river. That's a rather interesting case by Judge Morris. Uh, there was an individual who was caught jigging salmon on the Salmon Air River. He was brought before the judge. He told the judge, well, he said, the warden told me last year I was allowed to jig salmon with a fly. And the judge said, well, oh, yeah, well, the, the warden said that, but not right. He said, the law says you're not allowed to go jigging. But he said, on the other hand, uh, you know, you're a poor guy. Uh, it's not a, not a problem for you to take a salmon or two for the pot. And as a result, there was no charge and no conviction. So you can only imagine what was going on in those days, that the, the law said one thing and the courts interpreted a different way. Uh, you can wonder if jigging continues throughout the entire province. So with all these tourists coming, uh, primarily on the West Coast, there was an opportunity now for the people who had a vested interest in the tourism to promote the province and to promote their own enterprises. And we had in particular uh, companies like uh, Reed Newfoundland, Boring Brothers, Karen Sons, and they had their own brochures uh, put out to advertise their own products. And one of the first to put out a brochure was Reed Newfoundland Company. They put out a brochure called Fishing and Shooting in Newfoundland that describe the access and opportunities and places to stay and so forth. Then we had, of course, that five, five years later, in 1905, Krauss put out the Newfoundland Guidebook. And everything anyone wanted to know about coming to Newfoundland, the places to stay, places to fish, and rivers to play, uh, fish and hunting, he had described it in the Guidebook. There was a tremendous amount of information. While these things were happening, there were also sportsman shows being held in Boston and New York on an annual basis. That was the place where all these provinces across Canada got together in the States and, and showed their wares regarding the hunting and fishing potential. And Newfoundland was represented there by the, by the guys who were, who were working with the Reed Newfoundland Company. So they went to these shows and talked about coming here. It was a few years later that government got involved in it. And then we had Paus, we had another guy named William Carlo who was the chief sheriff here in the city. They wrote a lot of articles about fishing and hunting. We had the anglers and hunters themselves who were coming here, were writing. And they were writing in all these primary American and British <coughs> magazines and journals. And of course, you can well imagine, that certainly whetted the appetite for a lot of other people who had the, the resources to come here. And very quickly, uh, early in the 1900s, Newfoundland became world known as a sportsman's paradise. And a rather really interesting thing occurred at that time. Uh, which what we're faced with in, in fact that uh, made our waters what we are today. Government then began to promote Newfoundland as a place where it was an unrestricted place to fish without any fees and without any bag limits and of course without any uh, lease waters, free fishing. And that's what the policy was from the early 1900s. And that's when they started advertising and promoting it that way to the world. And then, of course, we had the ultimate promotion in the uh, late 1920s when uh, Palmer produced the, uh, the book, The Salmon Rivers of the Land. And that was a classic thing, and still is a very much a classic uh, book uh, on our salmon rivers today. And let me give you some example about the catches that the anglers were, were taking in the early 1900s. So without any bag limits, without any restrictions, they fished and took as many fish as they could. They ate them on site. The non-residents were here. They had them smoked every day, or they had them boiled, or they had them fried. Any way in shape you can think about, they had them. And if they didn't have them smoked here, they had them smoked like Dashwood did and sent home to the relatives. There's no such thing as release fishing in the early days. Give an example of some of the slaughter, as they call it, that went on. A party of four fishing the Salmon River uh, for 
three days, landed 200 salmon. Hardy in Labrador, fishing eight days, landed 184 salmon, weighing 4,000 pounds. 184 salmon. The one individual, one angler, fishing Grand Cairo River over a three week period, caught 147. Another angler who was out from outside the province, the land killed 300 salmon on the South Coast River and he left the 300 salmon to rot on the banks of the river. And I get the stories, from the discussion, all in the book that describe how this happened and how they were found out and, and what they did and why they did and so forth. So there was no concern for conservation. There was no thought for conservation. The anglers who were on the rivers, they were catching far more than they really needed themselves. It wasn't really a sport. It seemed like a competition between each other to see how many fish they could catch. They, after that went on, they then decided to monopolize the pools. They built cabins on the pools, preventing other people uh, from getting there. Because you had a cabin, you could sleep there overnight, you could be on the pool at 4 o'clock in the morning and have with your guides and other people. So anyone else would come in at 9 or 10 o'clock, they couldn't get access to the pools. And that discouraged an awful lot of people from coming to Newfoundland. Uh, and of course, that was in contradiction to what government was saying, unrestricted, free access to all the rivers. It was just as like they were leased, even though they weren't leased, because they were monopolized by people who built the cabins. So the government received a tremendous amount of criticism over the, uh, the lack of policy on the limits and bag limits and so forth. And a lot of people were pretty well convinced a large part of the salmon decline uh, was related to those non-resident anglers killing far too many fish. Anyway, two years later, uh, after all the criticism that came in, government finally caved in to all the calls to save the salmon and the trout, and they created an inland board, inland fishery, game and fishery board, uh, in 1910. It was felt that the board, being independent of government, were in a better position to manage both the game and the fish for the province. Uh, so they were appointed. They operated at arm's length the government. They were all sportsmen who had knowledge of fishing and hunting, and the only minister, the government member was the minister. And the board had the full authority for the preservation of fish and game in the province. The first act was to, of course, to rehire the wardens, and they hired 90 people. <coughs> but interesting enough, they hired, the people who were hired all did patrols elsewhere. None of them had patrols in their own immediate area, so they didn't have to face their brothers and their, their neighbors in terms of, of uh, charging them. <coughs> And they were given uh, all kinds of free access on Reed Newfoundland Company to go to these other places to, uh, to patrol the rivers. Second thing they did was institute a $10 non-resident fee salmon license, the first license in the province. And of course the money would, uh, they would have generated from that would have been also used to, uh, to go back into it and hire more wards and protect the fishery. Let's have a quick look at some of the uh, angling statistics at the time. Uh, this table gives you a perspective of, from 1910 to 1915, the number of salmon that were caught. Uh, you can see in 1910 there was roughly 3,300 that were reported to have been caught. No doubt uh, there may have been more, but these are the reported figures for all the rivers in the province. Uh, it doubled in 1911 and went up to nearly 6,000 and contained, it continued that way for the next five or six years. And of course, we have this information. And of all the research I did and all the government documents and papers I read, I could find no information of the total aggregate fish, salmon taken by anglers from 1915 to 1941. So we don't have that information anywhere. They got lists of both every week in the paper about a guy caught a big fish here, a big fish there. But they don't have this important data from 1916 to 1941, unfortunately. And interesting though, during this year, during, during those years, primary numbers of anglers were non-residents, and they were primarily fishing the West Coast rivers. There were a few residents fishing, but they were fishing salmon air and Pazentia and Garnish and Gander, but they were small in number. Most of the anglers were the, uh, the non-residents. But the important thing that happened during this period, 1910 to 1915, was the number of large salmon that were captured with rod and line by the anglers. Like the 41 and a half pounder on Little Codroy, 
38 pounder on Little Calabai, 30 pounder on the Fox Island River, 36 pounder on Grand Calabai, 36 and a 38 pounder on Torrent River, and so forth. And the Grand Codroy and the Little Codroy rivers were just prolific with numerous 30 pound salmon that were taken during this, during this period. So you can only imagine when these dangers went home and wrote about this and talked to their friends and the others that they touched to come back to Newfoundland. And everyone agreed uh, that this was happening for one reason. And the reason, of course, was the protection, the better protection the rivers had received by the wolves. So while the anglers were doing fairly well catching a lot of fish, uh, most residents were really frustrated with the inland board's inability to institute bag limits and get a better control of the fishery. Uh, and as a result, uh, they were concerned and frustrated with government not forcing the board to do these things. So what did they decide to do? They formed their own local organizations. And they were really the forerunners of our conservation groups that we have today throughout the entire province. Uh, and they were established, coincidentally, all at the same time in Grand Falls, Corner Open St. John's. And they really wanted to say to government, the poaching has to stop. Uh, the jigging has to stop. And they also said to government, we want to say in how salmon and trout are managed in this province. Interesting enough, uh, they also generated their own funds at that time, in, in 1928. They found their own money to hire their own wardens. And some of them worked as undercover operation with wardens on various rivers, in particular like Salmon Air and the Bay of Nord and the Grand Codroy and Southeast Pesentia. Uh, and they produced a large number of recommendations to government from the ice fishery to bay limits for salmon and trout, all of which in the early years were totally ignored by, by everyone. But I think most importantly, even though they may not have been successful at the time, what they did was heighten the public awareness about the whole idea of conservation and the need for government to be more accountable in terms of the management of the resource. During the 20s and 30s, uh, a number of interesting things happened also <coughs> related to the conservation of the fish. Uh, the first unfortunate one was the loss of Junction Brook in 1929. Junction Brook, as you probably know, it's a major tributary of the Humber River. And because of the hydroelectric development to serve the pulp mill uh, in Corner Brook, that whole <coughs> tributary was taken off. At the time, there were no laws uh, that prohibited that from happening. And of course, there were no laws saying you have to put a fish ladder or bypass to allow the fish to continue up. And as a result, of course, that tributary is lost. A few years later, another year later, the uh, nets were removed from within three miles of the rivers. So now they were spread out along the ocean, giving a chance for the salmon to get in and reach the spawning beds. In 1930, the first permanent wardens were hired to look after the rivers. We had 80 seasonal people at the time, and five of them were permanent. And that great gave, gave the opportunity to have a look at the trout fishery during the winter, uh, where it all was doing it before. And then in the 1930s, the research began on our salmon stocks. And the first research was done by an individual named Calderwood, who was a Scottish inspector with the fishery. He came here and looked at a number of rivers. And Dr. Thompson, a distinguished marine biologist from Britain, uh, came here as well. And uh, Thompson, in fact, is the very first one to ever do any comprehensive survey on the life cycle of the Atlantic salmon in this province. Now, that research was done, in, coincidentally, uh, when commercial catches of salmon peaked at around 6,000 tons a year. And then, finally, in 1934, government got kind of uh, tired of all the public pressure and the criticism about the inland board's ineffectiveness, so they disbanded the board altogether. And that was our first and only attempt to ever have an independent board of government ever to manage our fishing game in, in this province. And 20 years after it was established, it was disbanded. And when they disbanded it, they rolled all the activities and all the duties over to the Department of Natural Resources, uh, where some of it remains today. And then in 1934, they also got into looking at appointing a royal commission, again concerned with the declining salmon stocks and the commercial fishery and the sport fishery and so forth. And I think the most important thing that they had recommended was that there be a, a frequent, not an annual, but a frequent 
biological analysis done and the help of stainless stocks in the province, which is what we do now even today. And the other thing they recommended that we continue with the process philosophy of having salmon layers uh, opening up new habitat uh, throughout, the, throughout the province. And the last thing, of course, that happened as a result of the commission was that they instituted a resident license uh, for salmon license uh, at one dollar for the season. Now with the Inland Fish and Game Board disbanded, uh, the government decided to create the Tourism Board, the Tourism Development Board, in 1935. Uh, their responsibility was to, uh, for the development of tourism traffic and tourism accommodation throughout the province. And recognizing that the primary tourists and the important tourists at the time were anglers, they decided to advertise uh, the fishing opportunities in various magazines in the States and Canada and England. And they put these articles in, in the Forest Stream, Field Stream, and Fishing Gazette, all the fishing magazines you can possibly imagine. Uh, unfortunately, the tourist board got off to a real bad start with government, even though they reported the government. The first recommendation they made was that rivers, certain rivers in Newfoundland should be exclusively set aside as if they were leased to be Newfoundland Company. And they looked at rivers like river ponds, casters, crabs, uh, White Beer, Cape Roger, and so forth. And they had these, all these rivers listed. They wanted them set aside exclusively for the Renewable Land Company. And the second thing they did was said, well, we need to attract tourists to the St. John region, and let's introduce bass into the region, because the bass are there, the tourists will come. Anyway, thankfully, none of those recommendations uh, were accepted. So, while all this was happening, uh, Salmon Amy was about to take a major dramatic change in the 1930s uh, with the arrival of Lee Wolf. He didn't come here initially uh, salmon for the salmon. He was, high, he was in Nova Scotia in 1936 and 1937 at an international tuna fishing tournament. And both years, he caught the largest tuna on a lot of line. And that, of course, received a tremendous amount of publicity. And the tourist board noticed this, and they approached him. And they said, would you like to come here and work with us and develop the tuna to the sport fishing industry? And of course, in the rest of history, as we know, he did come. And in the later years, he spent uh, many years chasing and filming moose and caribou and caribou and hunting and salmon and trout fishing uh, throughout the entire province. Uh, and all these films were shown, They're not only here, but in all parts of Canada and the States, and again, attracting that many more tourists to come. By 1941, he had his first camp opened on uh, Portland Creek River. And a few years later, in 1947, he had his first uh, J3 Piper Cub, and he was flying people into the camps on the, on the west coast and the northern peninsula. Wolf was famous for a number of things, like the fishing vest, the light of tack, and so forth, the wolf flies. But I think, in my mind, the most important contribution he made was his advocacy of releasing salmon, of live releasing salmon. And I think he's well known for that. And that he began actually here in this province on Grand Cataract uh, in 1937. What he did one day, he was out fishing, he was catching all kinds of fish, the guides were with him. He took a piece of string, tied it to their tail, uh, released the fish. The five or six fish he had were seen again the next morning. The string was still attached, the fish were still alive. And he had then convinced the guides, hey, you can do this and play these fish properly, and they will survive later on. So that was really the the beginning uh, of what we call catch and release angling as it was promoted at that time. Another interesting thing that occurred uh, was related to our famous Newfoundland moose here, salmon flies. In the early years, of course, most of the flies that fishermen were using were all imported from England, Scotland, or Ireland, which is where they normally would have been, and they were the classic flies, the feather patterns. But one of the first people to actually make and sell their own flies in the problems was, uh, whoops, he's the wrong one here. There you go. Was uh, James and uh, William Murdoch. <coughs> and I don't know if any of you know rough here like me. I remember years ago, there was flies called the Murdoch Famous Flies. They were sold uh, down in the sports shop. And they started selling the flies in 1924. But that all changed in uh, 1937, because that's when we had the first open season for, for moose hunting. And now we had moose here. You didn't have to worry about all these fancy, sophisticated, and expensive 
feathers. You can now just take the hook and the pencil and the wool and the moose here and basically pressure you to make the salmon fly that uh, you're easily made. And of course, our Newfoundland salmon flies are very well known today uh, throughout the, uh, the continent as well. And then, of course, along came a lot of our early salmon uh, and trout fly tires like Ted Bunden, Bunden and Max Rabbits and Rocky Shostag and Cornerbrook. And we had Max Parsons and Heber Keynes and Ruben Sampson up on the northern peninsula, and then individuals Cecil Pelly and Roy Richards from Glenwood. And they're just the name of a few that began the whole business. So the sport fishing was starting to grow. Uh, a lot more people were getting involved in it. And the local conservation groups just continued to put the pressure on government for bag limits and controls. And finally, government did cave in in 1938. And they declared a season for salmon from May 1st to uh, September 15th. And salmon could only be used, uh, fished with an artificial fly, and no longer could you use worms in the rivers. And they did the thing, an interesting thing, they scheduled rivers like we do have today. We have scheduled rivers that are specifically defined in the, in the books. They also determined at that point in time or declared that there would be a limit on trout. They didn't do it for salmon for some unknown reason. And they had, of course, a limit for trout was 36 per day on the Avalon Peninsula. There's no limit elsewhere, but on the Avalon, 36 per day. And any trout, interestingly enough then, that was less than seven inches had to be released. The other thing, of course, in 1947, with the two pulp mills working, all the forest access roads and all the activity in the country, they recognized the importance of fish habitat, and at that time, they declared it illegal to alter any fish habitat. And then, 1949, a milestone, of course, in the management of our fish resources. Uh, when we joined Confederation, it was determined by the people who were in charge at the time that the best way to serve and manage the trout and salmon stocks was to transfer the whole responsibility to the government of Canada, where it is in fact. And just before I get another couple slides I end, but just to put it in perspective, this is 1949. There were no highways in Newfoundland. Uh, there was rough roads connecting a few communities. There was no Trans-Canada Highway. There was no old big highway to the Northern Peninsula. There was nothing to the Bjorn. And as a result, of course, the uh, the rivers were fished primarily then by local residents. There were very few non-residents coming during the after, after the war. And even the residents didn't travel throughout the province. They were just pretty well localized fishing on their own rivers. But of course, with Confederation, uh, we brought us new riches and industrial development and, no, and more roads. And hence, the wilderness would, uh, would change dramatically. So what I'll do now, just the uh, second last one, I just uh, bring it up to date. So where are we today? I'm le leaping forward now, as I have done in my book. That ends the discussion of the historical stuff from 1700 to 1949. And what I then did in the last chapter is, okay, let's recap what has happened since. Where are we today? Uh, what have we achieved over these years? Uh, so in the first in instance here, we, we know none of our rivers were released, as I indicated before, and the government still maintains the public open water policy. We never did have any hatcheries produced. Uh, we did produce uh, uh, some spawning, spawning channels in various areas to increase production, and some salmon ladders, as I mentioned earlier, in other places. But we continue with the process philosophy of good enforcement, and the use of natural uh, natural resources for the salmon habitat. In 1992, we had a moratorium on the commercial fishery in Newfoundland, and 1998, a uh, commercial moratorium in Labrador, all because of stock depletion. Today, we hire about 90 wardens, and they're all seasonal. They're only hired for about three or four months annually. But on the other hand, we got a tremendous amount of assistance from the provincial government. They put in uh, up to $4 million with the fish and inland enforcement and wildlife people who were also patrolling the rivers and the woods as well. But even with all of this going on, salmon stocks and the problems are still pretty well at their lowest level historically. We're in Atlantic Canada and Quebec in the 1970s. We had in the order of 1.8 million fish returning to our rivers. In recent years, it's only in the order of six to 700,000. 
There was still a long ways to go. And even today, as of 2010, we're killing an awful lot of fish. In, in this province alone, anglers took 25,000 salmon in 2010. On the positive side, they also released about 25,000 fish during that very year as well. We have the Labrador food, both social and ceremonial fisheries, which are totally legal and totally appropriate for Aboriginal people, that harvest about 15,000 fish. And we also have another fishery uh, that harvests 3,000 plus, because we don't know exactly, off the St. Pierre and Michelin. And they have no rivers. They have no salmon rivers. And we wonder why, of course, the Con River is not producing any salmon. <coughs> so, my last one here is, and just to recap, I guess the thought, you know, what has this history taught us? And have I, I've there any lists in what I sort of discovered and wrote about uh, and discussed here. Well, I think one of the first things that's evident that conservation for salmon is not a new issue. I think most people I deal with and talk to like, my, my uh, ongoings here and there, they say, well, this is only the past 15 or 20 years since the moratorium. It certainly hasn't been. And I think I've shown you here, I talked about it in my book, but that we really began in 1816 with Dublin and Hamilton in Labrador, and it continues to the dirty day, and we're still trying to struggle to conserve the species. <coughs> Second thing I think you notice from what happened over that period, public pressure is essential. The government never seems to act on their own. They never seem to do anything right unless there's a lot of pressure put in behind them and people uh, questioning them and making them more accountable. And of course that hasn't changed today either, it's still there today. Another item is wild Atlantic salmon, like any resource, are not limitless. Uh, no matter how abundant they might have been today or tomorrow, there's no guarantee they're going to be around uh, the next year. And I think if we can't realize that, when we look at this, uh, the cod fishery here, so we've got something else to think about. Uh, with the cod stocks we fly in. And this is also the place where we used to have the great auk and the Labrador duck. So our salmon stocks are not, uh, in, are not, uh, are at the lowest level that they are, and they certainly are very vulnerable at this point in time. And they have rebounded, they have not rebounded anywhere near what they, they had expected as a result of the moratorium in 98 and 92. I think the last thing is that the, uh, they need our help today. They probably need our help today more than they ever did in the past. Because while we're catching that many fish, there's no, there's no commercial harvest. And the only killing of fish is, of course, by the anglers. Uh, and anything we can do to help uh, reduce that uh, is important. And anglers, as far as I'm concerned, which I do, uh, not all the time, but uh, most of the time, uh, release your fish. Uh, obviously, a dead fish doesn't spawn. And even the non-anglers can get involved. Uh, they can be joining the conservation organizations and uh, <coughs> leading into meetings and so forth. And the more numbers these people have in the meetings and the membership, of course, the more clout they have with government. And the more governors like you to, uh, to make some positive decisions. And that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope I've enlightened you a little bit about our very history of science. Thank you, Donna. Thank you very much. Well, this is wonderful, actually. We get a chance to talk about salmon. Uh -huh. So, uh, any comments or questions? Yeah, yeah I have a couple of questions, Don. Uh, great yep. work, interesting stuff. Uh, uh, you did mention the, uh, the Greenland commercial fishery there, and, uh, and I was wondering uh, if that may have any impact on the uh, conservation efforts in Newfoundland. And also, it would be fair to say that uh, uh, in closing the commercial uh, salmon fishery in uh, the island of Newfoundland in 1992, uh, didn't uh, didn't really have any impact at all on the conservation of the Atlantic salmon, while at the same time, of course, helping and contributing to devastate the uh, economy of many outboard fishing communities. Well, let's look at Greenland first. Uh, most of our rivers, with the exception of all those on the west coast, from Bay St. George to Humber, Port McCree River ponds, most other rivers on the east coast, southwest coast, never did have the multi sea winter salmon, the large salmon. Uh, so the impact, the closure of the Greenland fishery didn't really help the East Coast rivers, the South Coast rivers, and to any large degree. The bigger fish they would have been caught and seen there would have been repeat spawners as compared to the multi-sea winter fish that would have gone to Greenland and come back two, and three, four years later. But it did significantly help Labrador because Labrador rivers were more well known for the bigger fish. Uh, and it also helped, of course, Quebec and Nebraska. 
the, uh, the stocks, with, except for the past couple of years, uh, have not gone back to what everyone expected after the moratorium. Uh, no one knows why. And I think during the first four or five years of the moratorium, people were thought to come leaps and bounds in terms of the number of fish returning. But also at about the same time, uh, we discovered that for some reason or other, there was a high mortality of salmon in the ocean. And no idea why. Uh, for example, the returns from the smoke to the adult stage returning to rivers uh, at that time were in the order of 10, 14, 15%. <coughs> Today, it's around 3%. 4%, 5%, and we don't know exactly why. And as a result, of course, the fish stocks have not rebounded anywhere near what we had expected to, with the exception of the great increase we had last year and this year. But that's still a long ways to go compared to what we had in the 1970s. Any other comments? Comment about, about habitat, protection of, of fish habitat, which I, I'm sure you agree is very important. I uh, have worked in the biology department for about 15 years, and, and I was walked to work and actually walked by Burton's Pond, where every year in October I would observe large sea trout spotting on gravel beds along the southern shore of the pond. And then last September, September 2010, I noticed the university engineers placing markers in the pond over, over the area where the spawning beds were. And I also noticed that they'd drawn down the pond by about one foot. So I, I talked to the lawyer, uh, Owen Myers, and I talked to everybody, and they said this is a blatant contravention of the Fisheries Act, which prevents the alteration and destruction of fish habitat. Um, and subsequently, I, I complained to DFO, and I complained to the university, and my complaints have completely fallen on deaf ears, and the ears where these fish spawn are now underneath concrete, or they're high and dry, because the university has destroyed the habitat of these fish. So my question is, how do we have any hope of protecting these fish when Memorial University of Newfoundland, supposedly the font of knowledge and, and good management, is destroying these fish on our own campus. Not a very good example at all. Uh, I agree with you. I, I, I don't, don't know why they, uh, they didn't reverse it, and why they didn't uh, take more appropriate action. But I can tell you this, under the Fisheries Act, uh, the minister and the uh, individuals who work in the department do have authority at times to allow habitat loss but there's also a clause in there, and I'm sure you're well aware of this, no habitat loss, there's got to be something compensated for it. But the point is, I guess they can make decisions that you can lose this and replace it with that, right or wrong, and that's, that's where it is. Well, this habitat has never been replaced with anything, and frankly, the letters, the correspondence I've received from the Memorial University about this have been basically a pack of lies. I think the other thing, if I can say it here, is the, uh, what you experience is not all on the common. Uh, and I think if we look back the past 30 years in this city, and not only here, many other cities, I'm sure there's problems and elsewhere, when you get into the intensive urban environment, uh, most, mostly our natural resources, whether fish or wildlife, are sacrificed for urban development. And you see it time and time and time again. Look at the examples we had on Rennes River, the channelization, uh, and, and yet on and on and so forth. But it's fairly common with many urban areas where they make those decisions for one activity over the other, unfortunately. And you had your hand up there? Yeah. Uh, I come from Pretty Harbor, and uh, the little river over uh, there used to be a, a small stream river uh, as where the radio plant company had the first hydro plant. And unfortunately, there hasn't been a, a salmon in that river since the early 1900s. And trying to get a fish ladder uh, back on that river was quite easily done. But unfortunately, the uh, corporate interests of Fortis and Newland Power uh, doesn't seem to uh, abide by doing such a thing. And in fact, the first little uh, pool that comes into that uh, community is called the Salmon Pool. And I remember grandfather talking about when they were young boys, how the salmon would get up all over, over and eat the small first stand water will continue to flow over. Unfortunately, uh, uh, like I said, uh, like this gentleman there, like the corporate interest uh, certainly seems to be uh, uh, 
very common in, uh, in, in delegating a, a habitat for a fish or any other species in the province. And it's the same thing that happened, uh, as you know, uh, several years ago out of Star Lake, where there was an incident that the, the, the area was bigger than they expected. But they back to the place like Pretty Harbor, another small community like uh, uh, the Rat and Brooks up in Central New uh, You know, I, I, I think personally, regards to many aspects of the current environment and for, for society, uh, they have a backbone as a, as a, as a weak jellyfish. They're very little out in Newfoundland or even in Canada for many years for, for uh, uh, food conservation uh, when it comes to uh, revitalizing areas uh, like a place mm -hmm. like down in Pity Harbor, uh, which would, 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 would be, uh, like you said, as an average for your question as well. And in fact, the ecology. Yeah, I know up inside, in the ponds there, there are still a few leftovers of salmon that got trapped in there. And uh, uh, I remember as, as kids, we would get that. If you weren't salmon, you these were pink. That is mostly wind issues that are generally quite inside, but uh, the, uh, the, the ones that we got were definitely you know, on sand. And uh, they still try to make a comeback because, in fact, uh, there's a lot of fish there somewhere. <coughs> Trout, the, the, the local brown trout, and in fact, he inadvertently, to a lack of his knowledge, uh, caught two salmon's both. Uh, and uh, uh, he said, the fish both, my, my buddy and I were at salmon fishing, and he said, oh, well, well, he didn't know the difference, but it's just that, you know, uh, as, a, as a side bird, that it, 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 it had to have to recreate it again from the salmon would come. I'll give you a a little example of, of how this has worked very, very positively during the past few years uh, was conservation and restoration on Ratton Brook in central Newfoundland uh, with light and power, uh, Newfoundland light and power with DFO and with a small storage group uh, in Norris Arm. They've been actively working for 10 years to restore the Ratton Brook River, which was dammed by light and power in the 1950s. I didn't cover that in my presentation because I ended in 1949. Mm. Uh, there was no uh, laws in place to put the fish ladders in. They were allowed to do what they did. They had to compensate in other ways. They built an old Paul spawning channel, I think, right, mm. partly as a result of it. But during the past years, that group and DFO working together, and they had a ministerial order issued only two years ago. You have to put in the fish bypass on this river. And you have to let these people start restoring the salmon back to that river. So I think, and that's not, this is not very well publicly known yet because of, of the activities that are there. Uh, they're at the point now they've stopped a couple thousand salmon into the system, even though they don't have the fish bypass now. So <coughs> the point I guess I'm making is if you, those concerns, even Petty Harbor, you work with the right people, you get the uh, agencies who did those harm, uh, danger streams years ago, who didn't know any better. You get them on stream, there's always a chance to have that salmon restoration be done. And I think these guys are going to be setting a wonderful example of what can be done in other parts of the province. Now, that brought back a lot of memories. I, my first summer job in 1965, uh, we took the last salmon out of <coughs> Little Rattling Brook and transferred them to Big Rattling Brook yep. above Bishop Falls. And uh, I knew it was time to retire when Rex Porter came to me one day and said, where was the fence? I knew I was a lot older than everybody else, so it was time to go. But uh, there, there's still uh, a, a group there, I think. Uh, Franz Pittman, I think, he used to be the area manager, and Grand Falls is involved with that. But they're, they're planning to open that river again, right? There's still a lot of habitat about that, uh, that hydro, uh, uh, mini hydro project there. So, Any other comments or, or questions? Yes, Jeff. Um, thank you very much for your presentation this evening. Um, I, uh, have had an interest in salmon fishing and salmon conservation for quite a while. So you say salmon need our help. Do you have some opinions and ideas, either at a provincial level or at a local level, what needs to be done? I think the most important thing that can mobilize people. Uh, we have in this province, I was up until two weeks ago, I was president of the Salmon Council for Newfoundland Labrador. 
and we had 12 affiliate organizations like SANE and East Coast, Spawn on the West Coast, Northern Peninsula Recreation, Fishers, and so forth. Uh, 12. We should have 50. We should have 70. And I, what I really said, I seriously mean that. The, the more organizations we have out there responsible for this river and that river, the better it's going to be. Because that publicity speaks. Uh, they have clout with the politicians, whether the federal, provincial, and municipalities. And when you have respect locally for those rivers, that's going to build. You're not going to have the problem if you have a petty harbor rat in book. That's never going to occur again. And you can work with those industry peoples to do other things. So I think one of the most important things we can all do is get engaged by having uh, stronger and more groups throughout the entire province like that. And then all the other detailed things, and like stocking rivers, river cleanup, and, and this and that, that would just occur naturally. You're probably looking for more of the specifics, but, but you know, but that's that's what it is, mobilization of people and yeah, I'm, more I'm, I'm curious to see what your opinion is sort of of hatcheries, of stocking. Oh. Uh, moratoriums don't seem to work, uh, both at a, a marine level or even restrictions on a, on a freshwater level. Uh, I think an example of what I've shown here, uh, comparing it to Nova Scotia, where they depend on hatcheries and they get very few salmon left. Compared to Nova Scotia, uh, New Brunswick, and Quebec, where they largely depend on hatcheries, where they're really in serious trouble with their salmon stocks. We, we don't have as many problems as they do. I don't think, at this point, the hatcheries are the way to go. I think the philosophy that government has continued to do with natural protection, uh, rearing, good habitat, access to the habitat, uh, and good enforcement is really the way to do it, as well as public education. Yes? Uh, in this land, I, I know that, uh, especially in the South Coast, that the uh, government is really promoting the, uh, the salmon agriculture. And I, mean, I, I, I usually go up uh, this side with my friend Dr. Berkey over here in the Grand River. And they, I, I see, like many of us, seen a lot of programs from David Suzuki onwards uh, uh, in regards to the problems that uh, the uh, agriculture industry is having on the natural habitat and the surrounding uh, sanders and escapees and the, and the, the salmon and the, you know, all those types of things, you know. Uh, uh, on one hand, government saying, well, uh, let's try to promote uh, 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 our, our, uh, saving our sanders and so forth. And on the other hand, it, 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 you got there on the south coast, a very large commercial uh, 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 actual fishery that for salmon that, 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 as you know, all, all the law of the country, out in the south water south Everywhere the agriculture, the fin fish agriculture industry has existed, uh, I've seen scientific written evidence that has had an impact on wild fish stocks. Whether it be in Norway, whether it be in Chile, whether it's Scotland, whether it's in Ireland, whether it's here in Newfoundland. And the Kosovic report, the Canadian Committee on Wild and Endangered Species, uh, species uh, they put a report out uh, a little over a year ago about the whole south coast of Newfoundland being threatened. And the only reason they come up with it is because the agriculture industry in Vegas Pier. Uh, they don't have the definitive evidence to tie it, but there's no coincidence, certainly there. There's a number of things happening with the agriculture industry. First you got the probably the most difficult thing is the sea lice that are naturally out there. And we probably all caught salmon you see when they fresh come in the water with the sea lice on them. But when the small young fish, three years old, are leaving the fresh water going to the environment and they go through those ponds where there's millions and millions of sea lice they can get infected pretty fast, and uh, they're very vulnerable to that. And the thought is that that may be what's, what's killing them. And of course, you have another issue is the, uh, the adults returning and getting the sea lice and infected. And the other issue is the pollution, the washout, the clean out of the cages, and, and everything's left there. And last but not least, you have the incidence of escapees. Uh, will they mate, even though the triple eye fish are not supposed to be able to mate with wild fish, wild eye salmon? They just recently discovered in the Brunswick in the McAdavid River that in fact they have uh, these uh, fish that are mating with the wild fish and now changing the whole genetic distribution altogether. I don't know how you impact this. Uh, in my former life, as I said a few weeks ago, used to have a lot of discussions with government challenging them on this, opposing it, not the industry, but opposing it in the way they're currently doing it and asking to be more sustainable and so forth. But when you see the federal government, provincial government pumping $50 million into agriculture in one area of this problem, the South Coast, you know they're 
They're bent on uh, going with that for the job, so they may or for sure. The state of Alaska has completely banned finfish aquaculture from the entire state. Oh, that's a large area. Um, and they have large, healthy sport and commercial fisheries, and they are determined to preserve these. So to me, it would seem like the thing to do in Newfoundland is to follow their example and completely ban finfish aquaculture from, from the province if we're serious about preserving our, all of our fisheries, really, especially salmon. Over in Norway, what they've also done is identified zones where there'll be aquaculture-free zones. And then there'll be other zones, of course, where you, you're allowed aquaculture to go ahead. Uh, maybe that's the way to do it here in Newfoundland to say also, well, well you, you made a spear, okay, but no, where else? And, and that may be quite possible because in Beta Spear, it's a good uh, water plant uh, in the ocean. It's a little bit warmer, a couple of degrees, because of the hydro development and the warming of the water coming into the ocean, where it makes it conducive to aquaculture. And because of all the other places, uh, it may not be conducive, and it may be a little restricted to leaving that area. Good suggestion. Anything else? Yes. Some rivers, like I'll be stopped like three times a day by the same guy. Like, I think that it needs to be more like a variety of rivers. And I was wondering, do you think we'll actually see some more enforcement happen? The enforcement for the whole inland fishery is a federal responsibility under the Constitution, totally federal in the areas province. Uh, they haven't lived up to the enforcement that's required, that's necessary, and as a result, five years ago, the provincial government got involved in it. Not their jurisdiction in any way, shape, or form, but they recognized the value of this resource as a tourism, as a traditional recreational activity. And they are spending, if not more, $4 million in total, in fact, on enforcement uh, today. Uh, on the other hand, the federal government is still spending about $1.5 million uh, with the seasonal guardians and about another $1.5 million with the permanent guardians. And that has not changed one bit in the past 10 years. And I think what we're seeing here now with the uh, uh, cuts that are coming in the federal government, to be honest, I don't think that's going to change in all reality. And it's a good that the federal government and the provincial government are cooperating, working together uh, with all the patrols and all the enforcement. But had we not had the problems involved, I think the fortune would be far greater than what it is today. And Lord only knows it's, it's bad enough even now with, with all that activity. Okay. Um Thank you, Don. Uh, it's a really wonderful perspective on the history of salmon conservation in Newfoundland. I really appreciate it. If anyone's interested in buying uh, any of Don's books, uh, they are available in the lobby. And if you have the time before you head home to see it, join us in the lobby for refreshments and uh, an opportunity to chat. Uh, our next lecture, uh, last Thursday of November, uh, the speaker then is Jim Connor. And uh, Jim is going to be talking about uh, an interesting character from Trinity in the 1700s, and a uh, fellow John Clinch, uh, who used to be a magistrate, missionary, doctor, and much more, lived in Trinity in the 